move this slide so shy, so I can't. There we go. Yep. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop my video here. Good afternoon. We're proud to have Dr. Jennifer Hutchins join us again for the um, next webinar, which now she is going to present the opioid ep epidemic. And so we have had her once before, and she described the, the pain management, correct, Jennifer? Correct, psychology of pain management. Psychology of pain management in the past. And so um, we are recording, I want to let you know that, and we do appreciate everyone who is joining us online. Make sure you use the chat function for any questions and answers, and those will be answered later by Dr. Hutchins. I'm going to let her um, introduce herself and tell you a little bit about herself and um, the Hutchins and Associates company that she represents. But I also want to draw your attention to the chat function, where if you are applying for continuing ed, there is a link for you to complete um, to let everyone know about your knowledge before and after. So with that, I will let Dr. Hutchins take over. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hutchins. I'm a clinical psychologist here in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, I am the CEO of Hutchins and Associates. We are a business that does training, um, supervision, and consultation. In addition to that, we should be um, opening our doors to see individual clients by the end of this year. Um, so we're super excited about that as well. Um, I have been working in the field of addictions for the last um, 15 years. Even before I earned my graduate degree, I was working in the field of addictions. My husband is also um, a licensed mental health counselor who specializes in addictions as well. Um, previous to this uh, current position I hold, um, I was the chief of addiction services at Hamilton Center, um, and I worked at Hamilton Center for eight years in a variety of roles. Uh, the opioid epidemic has a long history, and we're going to talk about the rise of the opioid epidemic. It's my theory that you can't figure out how to fix um, a problem unless you know where the problem originated from. If we don't figure out how to, um, if we don't figure out the, the etiology of the problem, then at that point it just becomes a Band-Aid. And I think, um, particularly for the opioid epidemic, we've been using Band-Aids for several, several years. Um, this is not to say that there aren't other um, epidemics going on in the United States. Alcohol still remains the most abused um, drug of choice for adults um, and adolescents, methamphetamine. Um, is still has a greater increase of um, abuse than many other uh, drugs, including opioids. But it's important because the opioid epidemic right now is one that is um, life threatening. Not that the others are not, um, but it's interesting to see the rise of it. So let's just talk about opioids for just a moment. Um, and I am going to be going pretty quickly at this point. If you do have questions, uh, please jot them down and we'll get them to the end. Um, and that way, you know, we can, we can uh, address everything um, in a more efficient way. Opiate comes from, this always cracks me up, right? Because everybody, most everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but most everyone has seen um, The Wizard of Oz. And, and whenever I think of opium and poppies, I always think of the Wicked Witch of the West going, poppies, poppies. Um, but opiate does come from poppies and, it, and it's developed into the opium drug. And then it's de um, several derivatives from that, morphine, codeine, thebane. And so, you know, for morphine, we devise heroin and hydromorphone. Um, codeine and uh, thebane have their own derivatives, but they all come from, originate from the opium poppy. poppy. That being said, we have different types of opiates. Of course, everyone has heard of heroin um, and heroin has a mechanism of action of a strong mu agonist. I'm not gonna read this entire chart to you. Um, and it was originally developed to manage pain and as cough syrup. 
in, in all actuality. And, and I'll show you some different ads from there as well. We still get codeine um, and hydrocodone and oxycodone um, and tramadol. A lot of people did not believe back e even in the early 2000s that tramadol was habit forming and yet it is. Buprenorphine we often use not only for pain management, um, but also for coming off of opiates, uh, particularly in pregnant women. Um, and then we have naloxone and naltrexone who are antagonists and they're going to block uh, that opioid receptor. And a lot of time, um, we definitely naloxone, you've heard a lot about that, I'm sure, to, um, to use for opioid overdose. Um, and then naltrexone is often used to treat not only alcohol use disorder, but opioid use disorder. And again, it's not diverted um, on the street because it blocks um, the mu receptor. And um, then individuals who try to use opioids cannot get high when they're doing, uh, when they're using naltrexone. Um, so a lot of uh, ways to use um, drugs and opioids, including is smoking it. A lot of times I'll talk to individuals who will crush it and smoke it. Um, and the time to brain when you smoke something is seven to 10 seconds versus injecting it. The time to brain is 15 to 30 seconds of injected to a vein and then three to five minutes of injected to the muscle. And so you might ask, well, Jen, why aren't people smoking it rather than injecting it? And what ends up happening with our IV users is that they develop two addictions. They develop the addiction to the needle um, and also the addiction to the drug. So a lot of times when they can't get the actual drug, um, they will inject air or saline, which is very dangerous because they will get a pseudo high from their addiction to the needle. And then they're snorting. The time to the brain is three to five minutes um, for snorting. Um, so it's just, and of course, then just taking, ingesting, um, and swallowing the time to brain is 20 to 30 minutes. So a lot of times people will start with the 20 to 30 minutes, find out that they can snort it faster. Um, they might go to injection. It just depends because there is a, there is a stigma against IV users in addition to that is worse um, than abuse of the drug. In fact, a lot of individuals in recovery will say, well, I wasn't super bad because I never used needles. And so there, there are conditions even with it among um, individuals who uh, have aberrant behavior. And then of course, smoking. Um, they will eventually get to smoking or snorting after um, ingesting. So now that we know how to take things and get high faster, that was a joke, please, please don't take me serious. Let's talk about, um, jokes are always so hard on webinars because I don't know how they land, um, but I'm here all hour, guys. So here we go. Let's talk about the timeline uh, for the rise of the opioids. In 1804, um, morphine was distilled from opium for the first time. So we're looking at, you know, obviously in the 1800s, of course, anytime anybody has something that um, people want, we're going to fight a war about it, right? So the first opium war broke out um, in 1839. Britain tried to force China to sell its Indian-grown opium, and British takes the Hong Kong, and then a separate war erupts in 1957. In 1853, it was the first, the first syringe was invented and the inventor's wife was the first to die of an injection drug overdose. And I don't want to skip too far ahead, but I do want you to see this needle. This is not a needle that is, that is something that I would want coming from <laughs> toward my body. Look at how thick that is. Um, but that was the first uh, morphine syringe in the 1800s. And, and you can see how easily it would be to get it wrong. Um, particularly for a drug that is as lethal as um, morphine. And then in 1898, a Bayer chemist, of course, invents um, the, the drug that is heroin, okay? And so heroin was invented in 1898. Now, what's important to remember is that heroin was first marketed as a substitute for aspirin. Okay, it was, a, it was a cough sedative. Um, in 19, or 1898, it was marketed as a cough treatment. And this was one of the first ads. It moved from a cough treatment to 
a soothing syrup. And remember, nobody ever, ever develops a drug thinking that it's going to have the devastating effects that heroin has had on the human population. You know, it's not something that somebody in a lab goes in to create and says, this is doctors particularly, this is what we're going to use now to wipe out as many people as we can. Drugs always start to, to be something helpful. For example, everybody has heard of Rogaine. Rogaine was not originally marketed as a, um, as a hair growth product. It is actually a blood pressure medication. And what happened was doctors were prescribing Rogaine for blood pressure because it is a blood pressure medication and having all these women come back into their offices um, with beards and hair growing everywhere. And so then they had to pull it off the market and then do some things to it and remarket it. So just remember that drugs are not originally developed to be quote unquote bad, right? They're, they're uh, developed to help individuals with things that they're struggling from. Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup is another way that heroin was marketed and it was marketed for children teething. Um, a lot of patent medic medicines contained opiates and then all of a sudden babies started dying because if a baby's crying and they're teething, you're going to put some, some heroin on their teeth, right? The soothing syrup on their teeth. What happens if they continue to cry? Well, you put more and more and more if you're, you know, not very educated and, and, or you trust your doctor or this is what it's for. We've all, you know, done it. Um, not heroin. That's not what I'm saying, but we've all, we've all said, well, this isn't working. Think about a toothache, put an ambisol on it. Maybe I should use more. And then babies started dying and people started overdosing. So they had to start taking a look at that. So in 1914, when they started taking a look at that, Congress passes the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, and it eventually becomes known as uh, the MIDI to solve the problems of drug dependence. Um, and they were looking for that pursuit of the holy grail. You know, what is the, what is the, the holy pill that can solve this non-addictive, you know, I, I'm looking for this non-addictive painkiller. Okay, so because people were developing habits, overdose, things of that nature, the United States said, I want a non-addictive painkiller. And in 1935, they opened the narcotic farm in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, this is now a uh, federal prison in Kentucky. It's, it's, uh, it, it's still used by the United States. It's a minimum security federal prison. Um, but Originally, it started off as a narcotic farm in Lexington, and it was a prison and a drug rehabilitation center, and it was also a research center. So when you look at things like that, you could see the patients were lining up for a shot of morphine during detox. This is an actual book about the narcotic farm. Um, the second man from the left had his head bandage, and he injured himself from falling out of bed during withdrawal. And so um, I highly recommend, if you're just interested in um, the corrections piece of, of uh, drug abuse and rehabilitation. Um, this is an excellent book to look into. 1951, Arthur Sackler and his name was in the news um, last year, but he revolutionized the drug advertising with a campaign for, the, for an antibiotic. And so in 1952, they realized, hey, if we advertise these drugs, more and more people will want them. And so um, they bought Purdue Frederick, uh, which then turns into Purdue Pharma. And in 1960, Arthur Sackler's campaign for Valium makes the industry's first 100 million drug. And that's important. First of all, it's important because Valium is a benzodiazepine and it is very habit forming. Um, and so, and the way they marketed it was they marketed it to women, right? Um, if you look up at old Valium ads and they're real, just Google them and press on images. They are very real. You'll see one that is a woman um, and they're marketing it against hysteria and calming down and making sure that you are acting the way that you're supposed to act. Um, and if you don't, here's this, here's this drug to stop all your stress and be able to be happy again. And it was the happy drug. Um, and that's where the word nerve pill came from, right? This hundred million drug, so hundred million dollar drug. So what happens then is then it reinforces the idea that I need to market not only drugs, but also habit forming drugs. Um, and we've all seen advertisements. You can't get away from them for, for drugs, right? Pills, things of that nature, antidepressants, bipolar disorder, anxiety. Um, you have a little cartoon with a with a with a 
uh, umbrella, I'm losing my words for a minute with an umbrella, that um, with a woman under it and it's raining and then all of a sudden when she gets on the right drug, it's sunshiny and she's able to pet the dog and things of that nature. And that actually started um, in 1951 with the antibiotic, but then was revolutionized in 1960. In 1974, they closed the narcotic form um, and transfor transformed it into a medical center in prison. Again, it's still operating today as a federal prison, and they do a lot of rehabilitation there as well. I know they train a lot of the prisoners to do a lot of different jobs, including um, dog grooming, actually, and offer several different certificates for that. Uh, 1980, uh, Jan Sternsward made the chief of the cancer program for the World Health Organization and devised the World Health Organization ladder of pain treatment, and this becomes important. The other important thing that happened in 1980 is that there was a letter published in the New England Journal of Medicine that became known as the Porter and Jick letter, and it simply says this, and while I know you can read, I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. Recently, we examined our current files to determine the incident of narcotic addiction in 39,946 hospitalized medical patients who were then monitored, excuse me, I have to move something on my screen, <laughs> who were then monitored consecutively. Although there were 11,882 patients who received at least one narcotic preparation, there were only four cases of reasonably well-documented addiction in patients who had a history of addiction. The addiction was considered major in only one instance. The drugs implicated uh, were mepridine in two patients, Percodan in one, and hydromorphone in one. And we conclude that despite this widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. So this became the essentially cornerstone that says, hey, these drugs are not addictive, and this is what doctors use. Now, what the letter does not say is that nearly 40,000 that those hospitalized medical patients of nearly 40,000 in numbers were all in um, a long-term care nursing home. And that's what they don't say. And so it's important to remember that when we look at different studies, it's important to look at the population because this letter becomes the cornerstone of the excuses or the reasons that people can prescribe, and yet nobody looked at the research, nobody looked if, to see if it was a peer-reviewed study or anything like that. They just went off the basis of this letter to the editor. While this is going on um, with the World Health Organization, we also see that in the early 1980s, the first Jalisco migrants set up their heroin trafficking businesses in um, Los Angeles. And so we've got one place over here going and yet coming up from under here, and this becomes important as we look at the timeline, um, over here is this rise of heroin and it's not your white powder heroin that you might see in New York City, but rather this black tar heroin coming out of the farms of the Jalisco migrants. 1984, Purity Pharma releases MS Cotton, a time-release morphine painkiller that's marketed to cancer patients. Um, and then in 1986, um, there was another published paper in the journal Pain that opened the debate about the use of opiate painkillers for a wider variety of pain. Originally, it was only utilized for, once it came off, um, of Bayer off, off the mainstream. Then it was only used for cancer patients. And then in 1986, Dr. Foley and Portinioi uh, published this paper that said, hey, we can utilize this not just for cancer patients, but for more, uh, more widespread pain as well. And so this is where Jalisco is. And what happens with the Jalisco, why this is important is that dealers circulate a number around town. Um, the person who's wanting the drug calls in and an operator directs him to an intersection or a parking lot. Then the operator can dispatch a driver who tools around town, his mouth full of tiny balloons of heroin with a water bottle nearby in case he gets pulled over or stopped by the police for any reason. Um, they meet the individual who's wanting the drug, spit out the number of balloons, take the money, and that's that. I mean, it really became a pizza delivery door um, style of delivering drugs, and it changed the nature of drug dealing. It happens every day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., because these guys keep business hours, right? And this becomes vastly important when we look at the opiate epidemic 
in the United States. Sackler died in 1987. And so now in the early 90s, the Jalisco Boys heroin cells are, are starting to expand beyond the San Fernando Valley um, across Western United States. In the 90s, Purdue Pharma also releases Oxycontin, which is also time-released oxycodone, marketed for largely chronic pain. So again, we got these two different tracks going on. Dr. David Proctor opened in Kentucky and it's presumed the nation's first pill mill. And it's important that we talk about these pill mills because really this has really caused one of the biggest headaches um, for the opiate crisis. And then the president of the American Pain Society urges doctors to treat pain as a vital sign. Okay, 1996, the president of pain decided to treat, ask doctors to treat pain as a vital sign. We're going to talk about why that's important in just a second. 1988, um, black tar heroin uh, comes across the Mississippi River and lands for the first time in Columbus, Ohio. So now we're not just having this black tar heroin in the Western states, but now it's moving over to the Midwest. Um, what's interesting about the pill mills is that rarely did patients during, while they were going to these pill mills, see a doctor. And there was a, um, there was a, a 60 minute report on this about two years ago. And it's very, very interesting, um, particularly about one incarcerated doctor from Florida. But it is a common theme that these doctors would prescribe these pills running this pain clinic and never actually saw the patients. Um, would go based off of assistance or um, based off of uh, the report and start writing these prescriptions. Still in the late 90s, while this is going on in Ohio, um, the heroin still starts to spread to numerous cities and suburbs east of the Mississippi River. Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, right here in our, our own state, is identified as a city with a heroin cell, not only in the 1990s, but also currently. It was 1998 to 1999 that the Veterans Administration and JCO adopted the idea of pain as the fifth vital sign. And this is vastly important because pain is very subjective. I work with pain patients every day and pain is very subjective based on your own pain tolerance. However, if it's a vital sign and I go to the ER, just like blood pressure, pulse, um, oxygen, other vital signs. If it's a vital sign, that means that they are required to treat it. If I report pain, they are required to treat it because it's now a vital sign. And that becomes vastly important because that changed the nature of treating pain. 2000, we have um, Operation Tar Pit, which is a DEA FBI operation um, that uh, targeted the Jalisco heroin sales and then it was the largest uh, operation and the first drug conspiracy case that stretched from coast to coast. In 2001, injured workers, so now we're starting to see some of this taking effect, right? Cover Injured workers that were covered under Washington State's workers' comp system or started dying of opioid overdoses. And yet, still, it wasn't till 2012, 2013 that the nation said, oh, 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 we have a problem. This started happening back in 2001 where people started dying over overdose because of treatment of pain. 2002, um, Dr. Proctor gets busted. So that was the first pill mill um, bust in, in uh, the United States that really got some national attention and he pled guilty to drug trafficking and cons conspiracy. And he served 11 years in federal prison. So you can see this is a different one. This is not Dr. Proctor, but this is a different pill mill doctor that was sentenced to four terms in prison. And when you look at it, you can look at, uh, he was ordered to forfeit $1.2 million. Um, but look at the amount of drugs that he prescribed. From 2003 to 2006, from April 2003 to early 2006, so that's barely three years, he wrote prescriptions for at least 3.3 million pain pills, a number of anti-anxiety and other types of pills, and was the largest buyer of oxycodone in the nation. There were 34 over death, overdose deaths among his patients, 19 of them from Kentucky. And so what's in, not only do we look at the amount of 
pain pills that he was prescribing, but also the amount of anti-anxiety pills that he was prescribing. Because an opioid and a benzodiazepine is an automatic respiratory risk, and they are not to be combined. And so at that point, we look at the practice of this doctor who was just simply furthering addiction. 2004, um, there were published findings on the death of injured workers due to overdoses, and yet still we don't say anything. You know, in addition to the medical side, we also keep in mind have to look at the black tar heroin cells because now they're at least in 17 states. Um, there are more pill mills per capita. Florida's tax regulations made it another center of illicit pill supply because Florida, they're just popping up everywhere and um, their tax regulations made it possible. 2006 was another bust uh, coast to coast across the country, second DEA option for Jalisco heroin sales, 2007. And so we're fighting heroin over here, but we're furthering addiction over here. Um, and yet 2007, Purdue and three executives have plead guilty to misdemeanor charges of false branding of Oxycontin and they're fined $634 million. They're fined $634 million. And while that um, sounds like a lot, Remember that Purdue Pharma generated $3.1 billion in the revenue on the drug Oxycontin. And so a lot of times when I, when I would used to treat um, individuals who engaged in drug dealing, they would always tell me, yeah, I set money aside for my attorney because you have to, that's my savings. And so essentially, this is essentially what Purdue did, $3.1 billion and they were fined $634 million. In addition to that, that money did not go into fighting um, addiction, fighting or focusing on treatment, focusing on anything that that um, were the negative effects of the Oxycontin, but rather went into other um, budget lines. In 2008, drug overdoses, mostly from opiates, surpassed auto fatalities in 2008. And yet still, this wasn't a rise of concern for some time. 2011, we started regulating pain clinics. 2013, we, um, the college on, they realized that it's been 75 years now since we've been trying to find the holy grail of a non-addictive painkiller and we can't find it. It wasn't until people that we started recognizing. Now keep in mind, there were other overdoses from the past. If you look at River Phoenix, um, he overdosed in the past. Um, mixing alcohol and heroin, and we thought, oh, that's really terrible. It wasn't until 2004, and I don't know the difference um, between the actors that we started paying attention as a society when actor Philip Seymour Hoffman died. Now, keep in mind, Heath Ledger, who had a wonderful performance in many of his movies, died of an overdose, and yet we didn't start paying attention until 2014. And that was when we first started noticing that we might have an epidemic and the transition from pills to heroin, because as pain clinics are, are being regulated more and more, people are having a harder time getting the drug of choice that they want. And so at that point, they're, they're moving to heroin. Heroin is readily available. And that's why the Jaliscos were important. Heather is uh, heroin, not Heather. Heroin is readily available. Um, it is, um, it's cheaper and it doesn't take nearly as long to try to convince a heroin dealer to prescribe me heroin as it does a doctor to prescribe me a pill form of opioids. So they started looking at that transition from pills to heroin. The FDA approved uh, Zohydra, which is a time-release hydrocodone painkiller pain with no abuse deterrent. It also released uh, uh, an extended release oxycodone with naloxone which is the opioid overdose for the antidote. So what does this mean for us? You know, this was in 2014, we're now in 2020. And what have we learned? We've learned that if we throw money at the problem, it helps, but it doesn't solve the crisis, right? So we have to look at the social impacts of that. Enough opioids are prescribed in the United States each year to keep every man, woman, and child in the country medicated around the clock for one month. In 2015, and this is even with the stringent prescription, um, prescription rules, right? Enough opioids are prescribed 
to keep every man and woman and child in the country medicated. 2015, 2.7 million Americans suffered from opioid dependence or addiction. At-risk populations include, and look at that number from 45 to 64. It accounts for 40% of all drug overdose deaths for ages 45 to 64. So it's not your 20 year olds and 30 year olds that are making up a majority of this. The majority of those overdose deaths are involved people who received legitimate prescriptions from medical providers. Keep in mind, pain is hard and, and it's hard to be in pain. And when we have this magic drug, and I hear it all the time, all these people who overdosed oh, you know, are ruining it for the rest of us. And yet still, we don't look at the data which shows that 40% of all drug overdose deaths involved people who received legitimate prescriptions from medical providers. Other at-risk populations are individuals on Medicaid and other people living in poverty with a low income because of the access and quality of healthcare, because they're more likely to be prescribed opioids at higher doses and for long uh, duration because opioids are inexpensive, right? The insurance, what we find is insurance would rather approve, and this is very frustrating for us as providers, would rather approve a pill form of Norco's than a shot form of an extended release opioid that will be safer for an individual because of cost. And right now, insurance is really dictating how we um, provide services as medical professionals because of cost. And so we have to start taking a look at that um, because the insurance doesn't care whether or not I die of an overdose, the insurance cares about how much they're going to have to pay. And the shot right now, a shot of um, Velbuca, for example, is more expensive than prescribing um, oral opioid pills. And it's very frustrating for us when we're trying to do the right thing. Um, individuals on Medicaid are less likely to have access to evidence-based uh, addictions treatment. In addition to that, environmental and social stresses um, increase that are increased are more prone to individuals with addiction in addition to addiction we also look at environmental and social stresses as taking a toll on the body and so if you're already in chronic pain and you get super stressed out stress actually causes inflammation in your body and so that's going to cause you to feel pain or feel more intense pain um, and which is going if you're used to that quick fix, it's going to have you going to that quick fix even more often than you already do. And so that becomes important as well to look at. The social impact of the opioid crisis it, um, also is important to look at. And so the Department of Health and Human Services found that nearly three quarters of states on unprecedented number of children entering foster care and parental substance abuse was cited as the primary reason. Now, does everybody go into foster care because of opioid use? No, absolutely not. And generally, when somebody starts abusing one drug, we're going to see polysubstance abuse as well. However, what's important to realize is that this has increased dramatically in nearly three quarters of the states because of parental substance abuse. And the opioid crisis has something to do with that. Directly related to the use of opioids, the Centers for Disease Control reported a record increase in the numbers of babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And NAS is a drug withdrawal syndrome that occurs in babies shortly after birth. Um, it's primarily uh, among infants exposed to opioids, um, such as prescription painkillers and heroin while they're in the womb. Right now, the way we treat individuals um, who come to us and say, I'm pregnant and I'm abusing, we'll put them on buprenorphine. Um, it is found to be safer for the baby. Um, there is no risk of, um, and actually new studies show that Suboxone is good as well, as well as methadone. Um, and so there's no risk for the baby detaching from the uterine alignments and, and things of that nature. Um, but they still will be born going through withdrawal. Um, and the number of babies born in the United States with the withdrawal syndrome has quadrupled over the last 15 years. Keep in mind, we saw this rise in the opioid crisis more than 15 years ago, but now we're starting to treat the after uh, math of it as well socially. Um, I always look at those 
those uh, those jobs that that you see every once in a while, and I want to be one of those those individuals who go in and rock those babies um, that are going through withdrawal. Because what we know is that when babies are going through withdrawal, even though they may try to reject human touch, human touch is essential during the withdrawal period. And so a lot of times um, your neonate nurses um, are very critical in that aspect and important in that aspect. And so, um, so that becomes very important for the baby's adjustment and ability um, attachment to be, uh, to have, foster good attachment later on. When we look at the medical impact of the opioid crisis, I wanna talk about the medical impact on the emergency rooms, right, the role. Uh, the emergency rooms play a significant role in the crisis. Um, narcotic overdose is the eighth leading cause of death within one week of an emergency room visit. Um, and so we're looking at people who are then uh, for, you know, overdose to have been naloxone, um, run to the hospital if they choose to go once they're awake because they can absolutely refuse services if they choose to go. And keep in mind that a lot of times when people are classified as an overdose, they're not necessarily arrested for um, having narcotics on them because health comes before um, a, a drug charge. Increased services, increased medical services um, has happened because of the medical uh, of opioid crisis, over 300,000 estimated annual emergency room department visits um, happened last year alone. And so you can, uh, you can click on the www.in.gov. This is the 2017 as an example. However, you can go and click on that to find 2018. And if they have it ready, 2019, it takes them a while to uh, pull that data together. And then of course we see new policies, right? Opioid screening tools, um, the cows trained to emergency department staff on how to address uh, potentially opioid dependent individuals. I've done a video on how to personally, not that I, you need to watch that, but I've done a video on how to assess and, and, and treat um, individuals just with uh, motivational interviewing who are trying to get pills, um, visiting that. Because remember with the fifth vital sign, I can be um, somebody who is addicted to opioids, go into the emergency room, say that I am a 10 out of 10 in pain, cry and, and scream, and they have to treat my pain because it is now a vital sign. What used to happen was they would give you a prescription, a 7A prescription, follow up with your PCP. Well, my PCP is not gonna prescribe me anything, so I'm just gonna keep going back to the emergency room or doctor, uh, doctor shop. Um, there's reduced administrative barriers to becoming uh, a buprenorphine prescriber. It doesn't cost any money. The only cost is um, associated with listing yourself on SAMHSA and perhaps the test cost. Um, there's a doctor here in Terre Haute that's an anesthesiologist who recommends that everyone is trained, every medical professional that can be trained and get their X waiver um, does so because it only arms you not only with the knowledge, but also with um, the ability to prescribe that. If somebody is aberrantly using their pain medication or hoarding their pain medication or not using it as prescribed, um, you can feel you know, more competent in doing something like Suboxone or buprenorphine as a way to not only utilize pain management, but also that addiction. Um, there's financial reimbursement for prescription opioid screening treatments in ER settings. Of course, Indiana had the 21st Cure Century Act. There's other federal funding to address the, this crisis. President Trump donated his salary um, last quarter uh, to fighting the opioid crisis. And, and we also have stricter policies on prescribing opioids. Very rarely do I see um, primary care physicians prescribe any more than seven days of opioids, and they just simply refer to pain management centers that are doing pain management effectively. The financial impact of the opioid crisis is ridiculous. And so the fatal costs and the non-fatal costs. Fatal costs include the value of lives lost to, due to opioid related deaths. And so lost earnings due to premature deaths and other valuable activities in life besides work. 
Non-fatal costs include workplace costs, so workplace costs, so absenteeism, presenteeism, meaning I'm here, but I'm not really present and I'm distracted and I'm not doing the work that I should do. Um, disability costs, lost wages and employment, and then incarceration. Remember that it costs a lot to incarcerate an individual, particularly for addiction. Not only workplace costs, but we also have non-fatal costs that include healthcare costs, excess medical and drug slots, uh, substance abuse treatment, prevention and research, and then the criminal justice, of course, police protection and the training for the police um, to, to be able to save lives. Um, legal and adjudication, correctional facilities, property loss due to crime, and we also don't talk about the EAPs that then the first responders have to attend as well, because when you're rolling up to the second or the same house the second or third time, getting ready to perform naloxone on them, um, there's compassion fatigue that comes along with that. In addition to potential PTSD in our first responders from watching someone nearly die or die while you're trying to resuscitate them simply from an opioid overdose. And so it's important to recognize that this becomes then a domino effect across um, professions. It's not, it's the ER, uh, the nurses and the uh, individuals, the doctors treating the individuals in the ER when they're trying to resuscitate these individuals for overdose. That's traumatizing. And we often don't address that in our healthcare providers, but it is very important because it is a non-fatal cost of the opioid crisis. And so you look at this and the financial impact of the opioid crisis in 2001, it was $11.5 billion. Um, and that was just prescription opioids. 2007, it jumped up $50 billion in six years. In 2016, it jumped up to $79.9 billion. And then the difference between 2013 and 2015, and again, they included the illicit drugs in the 2015, but we're looking at the cost of the financial impact of the opioid crisis at over $500 billion. And that's really, really significant, particularly for, um, for the state of the country. We've lost close to 1 million workers to opioid addiction between 1999 and 2015. And this is ages 25 to 54. And it accounts for close to 25% of the total decline in the US labor force participation. Opioid addiction cost workers 12 billion working hours, and that's that absenteeism and presenteeism that I'm talking about. In, in 16 years, 12 billion working hours were cost just strictly due to opioid addiction. And then for every 1% increase in unemployment in the US, the opioid overdose death rose by nearly 4%. And so it seemed like we were fighting, and still sometimes today, seems like we're fighting a losing battle because as we try to increase um, jobs, we are met with several different, um, several different barriers. And one of those barriers is not only overdose death rates, but also just overdose or opiate use. And so we want to, that we have to look at everything that it affects because these individuals, again, when you look at the 45 to 64, these are not your, you know, what people might describe as typical addict. And I hate that word because it is so uh, stigmatizing. You know, addiction doesn't discriminate from anyone and people can use opioids and go to work, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be their best on the opioids. Um, and some people can use opioids and not go to work, you know, because they can't function. But what's important to remember is that it doesn't discriminate. Um, it doesn't care how much money you have. It doesn't care um, what color you are. It doesn't care what your gender is. It doesn't care if you're Christian or Muslim or Hindu. It doesn't give a care about your religion. It doesn't care about any of that. What it cares about is that you take this drug and you like it. And so you continue to take this drug. And then it's going to, again, have that domino effect we talked about. So what does treatment look like, right? Because we talk about treatment, talk about treatment, talk about treatment. Old school says abstinence. And we see a lot of people um, relapse when it comes to abstinence simply because you don't necessarily die. Very few people die of opioid overdose. They just feel like they're going to die. It is like the stomach flu times a thousand, okay? Um, and 
you know, because opioids are designed to shut some certain things off in your body. And when you're going through withdrawal, all those things open. And so the nicest way I've learned how to say it is liquid coming out of every orifice of your body. And so a lot of people can't handle that withdrawal. And what we see is um, a majority of individuals going through abstinence only withdrawal um, all by themselves will relapse at day two or three when they just can't handle it anymore. So we look at pharmatherapeutic medications. Methadone is one. Um, Indiana has started to increase um, their methadone clinics that are simply only for um, treating opioid addiction. Methadone is rarely prescribed as a pain management uh, drug anymore. It's still occasionally prescribed as that. And individuals who have a severe um, addiction are are good with methadone. Now keep in mind that this is this is designed to be a step down process. Some individuals don't like methadone. It's important that the methadone provider also pro provide um, individual counseling. All of these require individual counseling, group counseling, perhaps some case management, because when you're in that um, when you're in that state where you're ready to come off and you're you qualify for methadone or a pharmaco therapeutic medication, it, you also need intense treatment because that addiction has gone there. Buprenorphine is for moderate to mild, mild addiction severity. Uh, Suboxone is the same thing. And then naltrexone is for mild addiction uh, special populations, again, because it's that agonist. What the naltrexone and, and the bup and the methadone um, do is allow us to hit that receptor without the euphoria um, and stop that, uh, that physical withdrawal. So then we can start to focus on the psychosocial factors of what happens with recovery. And without that, then individuals are focused on, um, if, if the addiction is intense, are focused on their withdrawal symptoms and negative, uh, thoughts come into their head. They feel like they can't do it. And so that's when they go back to use. When we hit those receptors without the euphoria, we're able to have a clear mind with the patient to talk about what leads to um, triggers, what leads to cravings, and some other psychosocial factors that lead to drug use. Contingency management, I'm not a fan of, <clears throat> but it is one of the only things that is um, dedicated to strictly to opioid use disorder. It's essentially saying, I'm going to reward you with um, monetary or uh, valuable um, prizes, gifts, money, um, if you stay sober. I do like recovery and training self-help uh, for opioid use. This was designed particularly to combat uh, opioid use disorder. Um, and it is a very effective um, intervention uh, that if, if your agency is looking to uh, implement opioid use disorder um, group and, and, and individual counseling, this is an excellent model to use because it also uses that peer recovery specialist um, that is vital in addictions recovery. I wanna show you this because this is important so that you understand the withdrawal symptoms where opioids numb you, then it becomes pain, euphoria becomes anxiety. And so a lot of times when we see individuals look at all those withdrawal symptoms, people think that they're gonna die um, and they're hard pressed to be convinced that they're not going to die. Um, but I have many individuals come in and say, I don't wanna go through withdrawal again. I thought that I was never gonna make it out alive. That's how bad this is. And so when you look at all of those, it becomes really, really um, physically intense, which then allows it to be mentally intense. And then at that point, that's when we lose people if there's uh, not any uh, pharmacotherapy. Uh, so methadone is used to be the most frequently used. It's not anymore. It is long acting. It has many formulations. Um, it decreases pain killing effects on opioids, buprenorphine. Um, larger doses don't increase the effects. It was the first one to be uh, indicated. Well, methadone, buprenorphine, and suboxone um, are all indicated for uh, to treat pregnant women. Uh, combination uh, buprenorphine naloxone is your suboxone. Buprenorphine street name is Subutex. Um, suboxone is 
um, the combination of two medications, and then of course naltrexone, and we've talked about those three. We like to see a phased treatment approach that comprises of five or six patient-centered phases for planning and providing medication-assisted treatment services and evaluating the treatment outcomes in an OTP. The acute phase, of course, is your withdrawal phase, your initial induction phase with any MAT. You've got your rehabilitative phase, your supportive care phase, medical maintenance phase, um, and then we want to taper. So uh, the, typical, the typical opioid successful uh, opioid use disorder methadone patient is going to be on methadone for about two years. And then we want to see a taper off of that. And they can taper down within that two years to uh, Subutex or Suboxone and even Vivitrol, um, but just slowly so that they start to avoid the withdrawal symptoms. When you feel when you feel better emotionally, you're going to feel better physically. And so after that therapy, um, we want to ensure that um, they are stable enough to start that taper down. And then there's that continuing care phase. There is variations of phase treatment um, and most patients need, however, intensive treatment services at entry, diversified services during stabilization, and then less intensive services after recovery benchmarks are met. I always recommend peer recovery services. In Terre Haute, there's you know, the Wabash Valley Recovery Center um, that is also starting to farm out in some of the um, some of the counties surrounding Terre Haute. Um, but I also read in Linton and Greene County, and kudos to Greene County, that they're also starting more of a peer recovery center. And I think that's vastly important and important, particularly for small rural communities to look into, um, is that peer recovery. Because it's one thing to go to a doctor or a psychologist and talk about what's what's going on and have them give you skills and things to look at. And it's another to have somebody say, hey, I've been there. Um, and um, I, I know what you're going through and I know what's on the other side and let me help you. And, and I think peer recovery specialists are vital not only to, you know, communities, but and smaller communities, especially, but also to ERs and intensive care units um, and addictions units. Assessment of treatment should be ongoing and the duration of treatment is a team decision and it's based on not only what the doctor is seeing, but also what your therapist is seeing and what your case manager and peer recovery specialist and you, you know, or the individual um, that's being treated is seeing because they are the driver of their treatment. Um, I'm not going to go into contingency management too much right now for time's sake, um, or recovery and training and self-help for opioid use. Um, just know that, you know, both of them work and a lot of times in inpatient units, contingency management is used. Again, for outpatient, this is the one that I prefer and that's just my, my professional opinion, um, of course. Of course, always utilizing motivational interviewing and see, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy um, and acceptance and commitment therapy. Those um, are the cornerstones of what you need to use but, um, and the cornerstone of recovering and training self-help. There's a lot of behavioral activation in that and modeling as well. Um, and so that concludes our, um, our presentation for today. I know I went through that vastly, uh, really quickly. I don't know why I said vastly. Sometimes my brain says the wrong word. Um, but I know I went through that very quickly. Um, and so if, if anybody has any questions, please feel free at this moment in time. And again, at this point in time, you may enter any of your questions that you have in the chat function. Oops, sorry, I realized I'm still sharing my screen. That's okay, you can keep your screen up. Dr. Hutchins is an outstanding presenter and I continue to learn something every time I talk with her or hear one of her presentations. We thank you for the time that you spent with us, Dr. Hutchins, and for all those who logged in. If there are no questions, I do want to remind you that in the chat function, there is a link if you are applying for continuing education credits, you will need to complete that uh, section on the chat function. Uh, there is a link there for you to complete. Um, also, this, uh, this webinar will be archived on the Indiana Rural Health Association's website. It's actually a URL and it is, it is on our, um, what is it, uh, Autumn? 
Is it the Indiana Rural Health Association webpage? No, no, it's not on our website. It's on our YouTube <laughs> page. Everyone so. who um, logs in also, um, we will be able to send you the direct link to this recording within 24 hours after the recording. Okay, we'll be getting the recording soon. It will be on the URL on our, um, on our page and we will also be sending it out to those who participated today. So again, thank you, Dr. Hutchins. And thank you, Tina. It was my privilege. The time. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye.